Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Dan Millman, who's here to share with us his new book, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, The True Story of My Spiritual Quest. So Dan's books and teachings have been the guiding light to millions of people. He's the author of 18 books published in 29 languages and is a former world champion athlete, Stanford University gymnast coach, martial arts instructor, and Oberlin College professor. His book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, was adapted into a film in 2006. So let's welcome to the show, Dan Millman. Well, thank you, Mary. I'm glad to be here with you. Oh, my goodness. What an honor it is to have you here. And soon as I got my hands on this book, man, it, it's a game changer, you know, and I, I was just so impressed with it. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Well, why don't we start with the title? I mean, that's one of the things that kind of really drew me in. What does it mean, you know, to be, you know, have the peaceful heart and warrior spirit? Well, I came about that term organically. Actually, when I was uh, relatively young, I was still in my late 20s, and I was an assistant professor at Oberlin College in Ohio. And I was teaching, I created a martial arts course around Aikido and Tai Chi. And I was going to call the course The Way of the Warrior, which makes sense. But their internal sorts of martial arts are more receptive. They're not aggressive arts. So Uh, a light bulb went on. And I said, why don't I call the course The Way of the Peaceful Warrior? And only later, when I wrote my first book, did I come up with, I think of that that term, oh, why don't I call the book that? And over time, people asked me, what do you mean by peaceful warrior? That that sounds like a contradiction in terms. And and yet, it, it seems like everyone I meet is a peaceful warrior in training, because all of us, are striving to live with a peaceful heart in our lives, a sense of serenity, equanimity, uh, in the chaos and change of everyday life, as we've noticed, particularly lately. <laughs> but it's universal. And, and so I think people could relate to the idea that they're striving to live with a more peaceful heart. But there are also times we need a warrior's spirit. It's not about fighting, um, except perhaps with those inner demons of insecurity, self-doubt, and various kinds of fear. But it's more about rolling up our sleeves, standing up tall inside of ourselves, and marching into everyday life uh, and doing what we need to do. And often that takes a warrior spirit. So it seemed natural when I was writing my memoir, a culminating work after 18 books and 40 years of writing, um, that I would call it Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, because it's really about all of us. And I wouldn't presume to write a memoir because I assume uh, legions of people want to read about this Dan Millman character, but more because it's about a quest we all share. Each of us is going up the same mountain, but by different paths. And so that's, that's why I ended up uh, using that term. And that's why it applies to all of us in our universal quest. Well, thank you for you know breaking that down because I think a lot of people look at that and go, gosh, this is very interesting. And they look at warrior thinking, okay, this is, you know, I have to bring my fighting spirit to my everyday life. And so when you talk about spirit, what do you, I mean, how does that play a role in our everyday lives and what does that look like? Well, you know, I, I used to think uh, uh, spirituality was something special and, and out there and elsewhere um, in, in a, a cathedral or perhaps a forest where we feel a sense of spirit. Um, but my view has changed. I think this evolution started when I asked my little daughter, then 10 years old, now a grown woman, um, an author in her own right. But when I asked Sierra to to name some uh, spiritual books she had read, and she gave me a list the next day, because she was a voracious reader. uh, And she gave me a list of 10 books, and not a single one of them had to do with metaphysics or the new age or, or religious belief even, they were books that inspired and uplifted her. And don't we all love to be inspired and uplifted? Um, and to me, that's what, what spirituality is ultimately for in a practical way in everyday life, that uh, we touch the numinous, 
or we touch that um, that sense that's all around us. You know, it, it seems to me that we all breathe and live surrounded by spirit, by beauty, by inspiration every day. But normally we don't have the eyes to notice it. it it's not like the, the weather person comes on the radio and says, 20% chance of rain today and, and 13% spirit out. <laughs> it's always here, but we are often preoccupied. What am I going to do about my relationship, about my finances, about my, the decisions in front of me? And so we're preoccupied. And it's only when we travel somewhere or walk in the woods where our eyes open up and we begin to see the world, even for a few moments, with the eyes of a child, that wide-eyed, wow, uh, and, and rediscover life and reappreciate our own lives. So to me, it's, a, it's about uh, freeing our attention to begin to notice the spirit that's around us all the time in everyday life. Well, it's interesting because you brought up some things I think people are really focused on today when they talk about relationships and finances. There's all this worry. So how do they integrate um, peaceful heart, warrior spirit with this kind of life? Well, as you've seen in the book, um, it, it covers some foundational elements of my own particular journey that many people relate to in their own way. But I was a young trampolinist. You know, who knew that jumping up and down on the trampoline would lead to a scholarship to college and a gymnastics career, a world championship, and uh, teaching at Stanford University, coaching uh, an elite team there. I never, ever would have imagined any of that. I just knew I loved jumping on a trampoline. So I go through my athletic career uh, as actually my, a precursor or even the first part of my own spiritual quest. Um, but then I address four mentors that I studied with for a period of, well, a little over 20 years. I didn't just gather initiations from one teacher or another. These were four radically different teachers. And I called them the professor, the guru, the warrior priest, and the sage. And in response to your question, after providing that context, uh, I would say the sage had the most realistic approach to facing uh, challenges, internal challenges like worry, anxiety, and various kinds of fear, self-doubt, but also uh, functioning well in the world. And, you know, functioning well may not sound too spiritual or sexy, but those who function well in life, those who finish what they start, get things done and have some modest accomplishments are more likely to have a default sense of fulfillment in life than those who don't finish what they start and don't get them. So he offered some reminders that I share with others in my own way. Um, it, one, of, one of the sayings I remember from him, from the sage, was that when running up a hill, it's okay to give up and quit as many times as we want, as long as our feet keep moving. In other words, his focus and mine is not as much about trying to fix our insides and have just the right feelings and just the right thoughts. Because um, many of us have grown up in a culture, you know, that assume we have to do that. We have to quiet our mind and have only positive thoughts and have uh, right emotions like confidence and courage and compassion and gratitude and all those good feelings, which are wonderful to have. But he pointed out that we have actually less control by our will. We can't will ourselves to feel differently than the way we do in any given moment, even though emotions are changing all the time, like the changing weather. Um, and we can't, we don't have a spam filter in our head. We can't stop thoughts from arising in our awareness. And then suddenly we notice them, the, the discursive or random mind, the monkey mind, some call it. Um, those are a part of our lives. So my approach is not to tell people how to no longer feel anxiety and to only feel good feelings. Many people claim to be able to do that, but I found we have, nobody has real control. It's not within our human control. Just say, I'm going to feel differently right now, or I'm just going to stop those thoughts. 
In fact, the best way I know to become obsessed with something is try not to think about it all day. <laughs> um, so instead of that, we accept our emotions and our thoughts as natural to us in the moment. And, you know, it's wonderful that your show is called Moments with Marianne. I like the alliteration, but I also like the theme because the sage also pointed out that life is a series of moments. Someone came up to me once and said, Dan, you know, after that talk, I really feel inspired. I said, don't worry, it'll pass. Because inspiration passes, motivation comes and goes. Uh, someone came up to me, uh, you know, sometime later and said, you know, Dan, you seem like a nice guy. And I said, sometimes. Because we all have neurotic moments and high functioning moments. We all have intelligent moments. I've had some intelligent moments. I've also had some stupid ones. <laughs> Ask my daughters, they'll tell you. So moments, life is a series of moments. And Cesar, uh, a man named Cesare Pabese once said that we do not remember days, we remember moments. So I love the theme of your show. And, and that's, so what I would recommend to anyone suffering from anxiety and doubts, which is a human thing, it's, it means we're engaged with life. Uh, I would say that it's helpful to accept our thoughts and feelings as natural to us in the moment. And while we're doing that, as we would in meditation, just notice them. Yep, they're there, pleasant or unpleasant but they're there, they will pass. And the second thing is to focus on a constructive purpose. What do I want to do? What would I like to get done right now? And you know, many of us concerned about purpose. I am too. Four of my books deal with life purpose. Um, so it's important. But the major purpose is not our cosmic long-term purpose, but it's the one that's in front of us right now. I know my purpose right now. You know yours right now in this moment. So to focus on that and then do whatever we need to do, despite whether we're feeling positive or negative, and, and do that. You know, the first time I won the National Trampoline Championship, I had an upset stomach. I was uh, uh, feeling nervous, anxious, but I still had to get up on the trampoline, start jumping, jump higher and higher, and then do my routine. And life is very much like that. As you remember, there's an incident in the book when I was a, a little kid, six years old, and I was playing with um, streetwise um, older friends, nine years old, and they climbed to a roof of a house under construction. It was the weekend. No one was there. And they were jumping off uh, into a sand pit down below, sinking up to their knees. And they said, come on, Danny, your turn. Well, I was six, and I really wanted to do it. I mean, how many of us have really wanted to do something, but we were afraid or doubted ourselves. And I, I went to the edge and I backed up. I went to the edge and I backed up. And finally, Steve, my older friend, yelled something that I, I really never forgot. He said, Danny, just stop thinking and jump. And that became like a master metaphor for me that I remembered years later. It worked well in gymnastics uh, when I was feeling nervous or afraid, but <laughs> not, not as well in relationships all the time. <laughs> so uh, everything in moderation. Uh, but, but that's how I, I learned to face fear. Uh, I learned to, um, you know, there's a saying, don't act without thinking and don't think without acting. Uh, there's that balance that each of us can do. So we have stresses in everyday life. We can't really stop stress, but we can Learn to remember to take a deep breath and relax our body. And you know, stress is not nearly as, as harmful when you're relaxed at the same time. So that's under our control. Whereas we can't uh, guarantee that we'll never feel stress again. It's again, it's being engaged with life. So that's what comes up for me in response to your lovely question. Well, thank you for taking the time to really expand on that for our listeners, because, you know, one of the things I hear all the time, and in, in, uh, you talked about you have four books that talk on this, is purpose and how people feel about their lives that way. I mean, do you feel like life is unfolding the way it should? Well, it's interesting. In, in one of my books called The Hidden School, which was the third in the Peaceful Warrior Saga, um, the major theme I address there is a paradoxical theme. What that means is it 
it embraces apparent opposites. Now, what do I mean by paradox? And, and really, I am answering your question here, but providing a context. Um, remember the opening to A Tale of Two Cities, uh, that wonderful book? It starts out, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And we could relate to that. Most of us could argue it's the best of times and find many reasons for that. And we could also argue it's the worst of times. Uh, so how can they both be true? Well, it turns out we live in two realities. One is, appropriately, we live in the conventional world, the conventional mind. We do our homework, we do the housework, we do um, uh, go, go you know, to work and school and uh, raise kids, whatever we need to do in this world. And probably 99% of our time is often spent in the conventional mind. But there's also a transcendental mind. And that is the bigger picture. It's as if we were down in the weeds at the bottom of a mountain and suddenly find ourselves transported to the peak of that mountain. And we look around at a panoramic view. Everything looks more beautiful from a distance. And that big picture, that big mind, call it transcendence, call it enlightenment, whatever we call it, um, that has different truths. So one can say uh, that we have that time is real, time passes. That's a conventional truth. It's observable. But transcendentally speaking, there is no such thing as passing time. All we have is one present moment after another. It's the eternal present. Someone can say, wait, I know the past exists, Dan. I have a photograph of my last birthday party. But all they're doing is showing me an image in this present moment. So by handling what's in front of us, rather than getting lost in memories or imagination, memories of the past or imaginations of the future, we realize reality, our moment of power is right now what's in front of us. That's what we can control. That's when we can act. This moment, this moment, and this moment. So. Uh, in in this, this paradoxical world we live in, where free will exists, conventionally speaking, but, you know, for example, we can make choices anytime, every day. But can we choose what we're going to choose? That may possibly be, be determined. And that's a transcendental or big picture truth. Um, so there are other paradoxes like that, opposites, that I go into in that particular book. Um, so when you ask is everything unfolding as it should? Getting back to your question, I can properly answer it now. Conventionally speaking, no, no. We, we, there's so many things you or I or listeners would like to improve or change, whatever our views about life, politics, anything else, they're things we'd like different. But transcendentally speaking, and I've been, I've visited that place. It, it hit me once on a, a sidewalk in Berkeley. I, it, I, I actually discussed this in brief. I mentioned it in, in the new book, In Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit. Um, I was sitting at a curb on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. I was a college student, a young athlete, and I had a couple hours before workout. I had just like free attention, free space. I'd done my homework. I just was sitting and enjoying life. And actually, I remember eating it. I was eating a grapefruit I just bought from a kind of a you know, local market. And as I was doing that, I looked at cars driving by at eye level because I was sitting on the curb, exhaust coming out of the cars, some litter in the streets. And suddenly, for no reason I can describe, everything was absolutely perfect. I was perfect. The world was perfect. Even though the Vietnam War was going on and all these things were happening, I saw, I could not see it, but anything less than a perfect part of our lives unfolding. So transcendentally speaking, it's all divine perfection. We're learning lessons. They're getting dramatic. Um, and we have to stay with it, continue working with it. And just stay the course, do what we can. I think it will make a huge difference in our lives as human beings when we begin to shift from a competitive mind, me first, to a more collaborative mind, where what's for the highest good of all concerned? What's for the good of our children, our grandchildren? 
and future generations? What do we really want for, not just for ourselves in the short term, but what do we want for the world to look like? And when we can make that shift, I think uh, humanity has a, a pretty good chance. Well, wouldn't that be a great place to come from? <laughs> yeah. You come from that kind of place. Well, and it has me kind of thinking. I mean, you met these four remarkable mentors. Did you kind of go out in search of them or did they find their way to you? Uh, well, <laughs> again, uh, a little background here. Um, when I was young, I was totally into self-improvement. I read books on vocabulary building, on speed reading. I took courses in memory, memorizing many objects at once. I, I learned sleight of hand and, and, and uh, ventriloquism and acrobatics and martial arts. I was really into learning and improving myself. And one day, though, I, it's not that I burnt out. I think the better each of us is, the better it is for the planet. But I realized no matter how much I improved myself, only one person benefited. But if I could somehow influence other people, that would make my life more meaningful. I didn't know at the time how I would do that. I hadn't written any books. I was teaching gymnastics and doing gymnastics, but I, I just knew that impulse was in me. I guess it was the first calling as a teacher, even while young, though I had nothing at the time really to teach, but, but sports. Um, but I believe that commitment to share whatever I learned with other people was what opened me up to finding these four uh, radically different master teachers, one at a time. And, but the way I met them, well, I, I go into that in the book, of course, and, and why I moved on um, are, are part of the whole story. So let's just say it seemed like apparent coincidences and synchronicities and timing uh, that I happened to meet these four different teachers. And I wasn't even looking for a teacher after the first two. That was 10 years of my life, training in depth, a way of life with the professor and then the guru, uh, doing an immense number of spiritual practices and techniques uh, and programs and learning models and maps of human consciousness and all that. Um, I was no longer looking for a teacher. I, I had written Way of the Peaceful Warrior after that, after the, the influence of the first two teachers. But then through another coincidence, uh, someone said, called me up out of the blue. I didn't know them. And they said, uh, this fellow, uh, his name was Michael Bookbinder. He, he read your first book, Dan, and because I only had that one book. He read your book and, and he'd love to meet you. And he's giving a talk at a local women's center, uh, a women's club down not too far from you. And so I, I, I wasn't even going to go because I wasn't looking. I was no longer really searching for a teacher. But Joy, you know, the kids were, the, our little girls were uh, asleep for the night and, and Joy was busy with something and said, Dan, well, you know, what about this martial arts fellow, this teacher, metaphysics guy? Uh, why don't you just drop by there? And I'm sure glad I took her advice because when I saw him, it was like meeting a long lost brother. And we traveled together, we taught together, and, and uh, in a sense, I apprenticed with him as well. He was a dramatic type teacher, uh, unlike any of the others. And then later on, I would find the sage through various changing circumstances. So that's the best way I can respond to, to that question about these four teachers. By the way, I'm not claiming they, I had the best teachers of ever uh, for anyone could find. Uh, aren't I lucky? Actually, I don't believe there is a best teacher or best book or best philosophy or best religion or best diet or best system of exercise. I only believe that there is the best for each of us at a given time of our lives. So I have complete respect for each individual and the choices they make, finding what's best for them. And we've all had mentors, role models, and inspiring teachers in our lives. We might remember one or two or three teachers from uh, elementary or middle school or high school or even college who uh, demanded our best and who inspired us. So we've all had mentors, but these four represent four radically different approaches to the spiritual quest, which I describe in the book. 
is the um, peaceful heart warrior spirit kind of a way of living and something that you do throughout your entire lifetime? Or is this something that could be cultivated in a like six months or a year? Oh, it's a lifetime practice. I'm still practicing myself. And I point out in the book some humorous incidents that happened. Um, <laughs> for example, I, I was giving a talk in Melbourne, Australia, and I was introduced to this very large audience. Uh, I was among other speakers that they invited in. And they said, Dan Millman is an uh, expert in mindfulness from America. Mindfulness, hmm. So uh, the first thing I said to them was, you know, folks, my wife would beg to differ. <laughs> because when she sees how I sometimes do the pots, scrub the pots or do the dishes after she makes us a nice meal, um, she always finds spots I missed. So I'm still practicing mindfulness. By the way, mindfulness has become a kind of thing. People think, oh, I practice mindfulness. But all it means is just paying attention to what's going on in the present moment without judgments, just being aware. And when we turn inward, we call it mindfulness meditation. When we turn outward into the world, we call it paying attention, noticing what's around us. Um, there was an interesting phrase the sage uh, offered to me. He said, when passing by a mirror, notice the frame. What does that mean? Well, it means we're, most of us are preoccupied with ourselves. How do I look? Uh, am I doing okay? Uh, all about me. And those who are the happiest in the world have their attention on other people and the world and what they'd like to offer. And so turning our attention mindfully into the world, I think can be a very good practice rather than getting lost in, in ourselves. So the frame of the mirror represents the outside world and uh, noticing the beauty around us. So those are the kinds of practices. This approach that I came up with called the Peaceful Warrior's Way is, again, it's about all of us, and it takes place here and now in daily life. Now, you know, anyone obviously who's interested and curious about this approach can always drop by my website. We can mention it later if you like. Um, and there's a life purpose calculator there. It's free. You can just put in your date of birth and maybe uh, glean some interesting information, uh, sampling of what I have in, in longer programs and books and so on. So that's, and also the books and my online courses and all that are, are, can be found at the website. Why don't you share that website with us? Because I found it to be such a great resource. Sure. Um, it's PeacefulWarrior, not surprising, dot com. PeacefulWarrior.com. Well, that's easy enough to remember. Well, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thanks for giving me the room to run. Well, thank you, Dan. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit the true story of my spiritual quest. Peaceful Heart Warrior Spirits available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, just ask for them to order. And of course, remember, support our indie bookstores. You can also pick up this book from the publisher, New World Library, at newworldlibrary.com. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after these messages. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a 
a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.